Brooke, what do you think? Is Trump your, is he going to win it? Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage. Thank you very much. How much do you have to earn if you're at that 120,000 quid just to oh, survive? Oh, you know, I mean, even people earning good money in London um, are not living high on the hog. I, mean, I know this is not an investment show, but I'm beginning to think about buying Argentinian bonds as an investment. Let's move to Argentina. Plan B now, as you say, becoming a plan A. Having a basic insurance policy for anything in life makes sense. You know, if things go wrong, where do we go? What do we do? And I was going through a period of, I must be honest, some panic about this. I mean, it really very scary. From London, we're joined by Mr. Brexit himself. It's Nigel Farage. Uh, good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, Nomad Capitalist Live, you will be coming for the second time this September. Kuala Lumpur, looking forward to having you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I must say, I think it's even more relevant than it was last time. You know, I came to Mexico City with you last time and I was kind of saying, look, I understand why you guys exist. You're an insurance policy. You're a backstop if all goes wrong. What I've seen happen in the last few years since then with taxation, particularly marginal taxation rates in the UK, we are now seeing for the first time since 1978 uh, a genuine brain drain away from this country and that's the younger more talented people and now we have a British Conservative Party well I say Conservative Conservative in name uh, if not in action now bringing in uh, you know rules about non-doms and we're now you know the exodus is beginning and I regret that it's beginning but it is and that's a matter of fact which is where organizations like yours come in to give people best advice on where to go and how to do it. So if you want to see Nigel, nomadcapitalist.com slash live. We're going to get into all those things. Uh, and you, I remember you first came uh, in 2022 when it was the Liz Truss, will she outlast a head of lettuce? And that was it. And, and the queen had just passed away. There was a lot happening. I was literally sitting outside the hotel in Mexico City on the phone, uh, still really in a state of mourning. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, you know, I'm 60 years old and that woman had been there for the whole of my life. I had never put a foot wrong. Uh, the constitutional monarchy worked beautifully. I mean, I think she was the most, I think, I genuinely believe she was the most respected human being in the world. You know, head of a commonwealth with two and a half billion people living within it. So it was a, that was a massive event. But then I sat outside the hotel in Mexico. I watched the Liz Truss quasi quarting budget. And I'm going, this is great. I love this. This is amazing. But as the budget went on, I began to realize, crikey, they're doing an awful lot at once. And it was too much too soon. It was all the right direction. It was all about reducing the size of the state. It was all about giving people incentives through sensible taxation levels, not punitive taxation levels. All of it was right, but done perhaps in the wrong order, done far too quickly. And my goodness me, the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of England, all the globalist forces literally got together to condemn, smash the budget. The Bank, unbelievable, the Bank of England sold UK bonds on the eve of the budget. I mean, a willful act, a willful act from the Bank of England to destabilize an elected British government. Quite extraordinary things that went on. So yeah, my last trip with you was a very dramatic time, but it kind of, in a way, what Liz Truss, and it was done, I mean, and I like Liz, but it was done naively. In a way, what she was trying to do was to make people not need to go to know my capitalist. But in effect, the fact that her budget was smashed. Uh, that is one of the hard things. I mean, for me, you observe what's happening in the world. I grew up 25 years ago learning, hey, you know, the United States, probably towards the end, things are getting a little, little squirrely. We cannot want that to happen. But I think people get stuck in the idea of, well, I don't want it to happen. Therefore, I'm just going to stay around and bury my head in the sand. I, I think 
you can not want it to happen and also be prepared. The plan B now, as you say, becoming a plan A. Yeah, I think that's right. I, mean, I think, look, having a basic insurance policy for anything in life makes sense. You know, if things go wrong, where do we go? What do we do? But I think it's now become an active reality. I mean, think about this. You know, you're a young person, you're 26, 27 years old, <clears throat> you're well qualified. Uh, you're working in you know, Canary Wharf in London for one of the big accounting companies or whatever it is. You've got a couple of steps up the ladder. You're earning £120,000 a year. Let's say at 26, 27, you're doing pretty well in life. Well, you should be doing pretty well in life. But your marginal tax rate will be 62 pen, uh, pence in every pound that you earn. And if you still have student loans to pay back from your time at Oxford or wherever it was, uh, you'll be paying 70%. Now, OK, I accept that's on the last part of the salary, but still, you know, you get any tax rate that gets to 50% or above, and people start to say, what is the beep? Are beep, you a free beep, country? Beep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My, my father suggested, he said, you should have Paul McCartney come and speak and I don't think he would come and speak about this because didn't the Beatles leave when it was like 90%? You're so, not that far away at 70. So I grew up in the 70s under a Labour government when we were a genuinely socialist state in this country. If it, By 1979, if you earned more than £38,000 a year, your top rate of tax was 83% on earned income. On unearned income... Like a royalty. It went up to 98%. 98% on like the music royalty. 98%. So Paul McCartney, yeah. Mick Jagger, you know, you know, many other people just fled the country. Cultural ambassadors, in a sense. In some ways, them going around the rest of the world wasn't all bad because, <laughs> because they were our talent. But yeah. the tragedy was the number of newly qualified surgeons, the number of highly qualified accountants, those people in that sort of 25 to 40 year old bracket, the kind of people that you want to be successful, uh, entrepreneurs that take risk and create jobs. They were the people that were leaving back in the 1970s. And then we had this period in the 80s, albeit after some quite difficult politics, where suddenly the world wanted to come to Britain. And really, for the last 25, 30 years, the world has wanted to come to London. You will not get better theatre. You will not get better sporting events. I mean, what can compare to Wimbledon or, or you know? Is this I, what you tell Trump when you guys meet? Yeah, no, no, no. He, I mean, Trump actually loves this country. Trump love. I mean, you know, Trump's mum was a Scot. Trump loves this country. But I mean, you, know, you, know, you can go to Wimbledon. You can go to the Lord's Test match. You can go to Derby Day race. I mean, we have some wonderful cultural and social events in London. Uh, it's a beautiful place. You know, the bits of it that weren't bombed anyway. You know, it's a beautiful place. Um, so the world started coming to London. And when did that start with Hong Kong and the, and the talk of the handover? When did that start, do you think? No, I think, it, I, I think the big one was Nissan coming in the late 1980s. Albeit that was the north of England, but Nissan came and invested. The French banks deserted Paris, started a headquarter in London. We were in a period of competitiveness, not just on tax, but on regulation compared to our European neighbours. As I say, the history, the culture, uh, the social life of London. I mean, where else in the world can you get, you know, what you can get in London? And yet, we're now at a place where people are leaving London and they're off to Dubai. They're off to all sorts of destinations around the world. The younger entrepreneurs are off to other parts of Europe. Australia, once again, is a very popular place. I would imagine for a lot of people, though, I mean, at Nomad Capitalist Live, what are we, it's 130 US dollars for a, a room in a beautiful hotel. I'm in a beautiful hotel. It's over $1,000 here. I admit that has to contribute. It's bloody expensive around here. Oh, I mean, London is very expensive. Of course it is. Um, insanely expensive. On top of high, you, you've got to, I mean, how much do you have to earn if you're at that 120,000 quid just to oh, survive? Oh, you know, I mean, even people earning good money in London um, are not living high on the hog. Uh, you know, the cost of living is very, very tough. Very, very tough. Uh, we have a huge housing crisis. So buying houses has become beyond the reach of many people. Renting property becomes, you know, in many cases, 30, 40% of your total net income. So these are, the, these are very, very, very real issues. But we're seeing, and we've had 14 years of so-called conservative government. We've had Brexit, which was supposed to be the liberation 
Well, it was the liberation in the sense we no longer take rules or laws from elsewhere, but we haven't actually taken advantage of it. We haven't deregulated. We haven't reduced the size of the state. In fact, the state's got bigger and Why? bigger and bigger. I think because those that have governed in the name of being conservative are not conservatives. They don't believe in a small state. They don't believe in light touch regulation. They don't believe in low tax. And I think one of the reasons is they're very much in the pockets of the corporatists, the big corporate companies that increasingly dominate the world, who of course are not capitalists, not capitalists at all. The big firms don't believe in free markets. Uh, you know, they actually like a high level of regulation because it stops small and medium sized competition coming up and challenging them. And I think it's one of those odd things. The left condemns capitalism. We're not living in capitalism. We're living in corporatism. And it's rather like the conservatives have been captured by all of this. Now, I am an unashamed free market capitalist. You know, I believe that you need some basic level of regulation, some basic degree of safety and security, but I, in the end, I believe in caveat emptor. You know, I think actually in the end, it's, it, it is consumer choices that work out who succeeds, who fails, what products are good, what products are bad. Is that what people want, to your earlier comment? Has the society gotten to the point, I would argue this in the United States, what I see in Canada, what I see in Australia, is it the same way here? People don't want caveat emptor, you're going in the wrong direction. Well, you know what? If I inject you now with heroin, right, you know, in two or three days' time, you'll be screaming out for more. Is that more. what happens around here? Oh, well, there's plenty of that going on here. But if I inject you with a drug, you know, whether you want it or not, you in a few days' time will come back to me and say, Nigel, I want some more of that. And that is the effect that the welfare state has had. That is the effect that, you know, Big Brother will look after you has had. So do a majority of people in the country believe in free market capitalism? No, no. But leadership isn't about following where people are now. Leadership is about saying, guys, there's a better place we could be, where you'd be freer, where you'd be richer, where you'd be healthier. That's what leadership needs. And at the minute, we have politics across much of the Western world that is more about followership than it is about leadership. Yeah, I think it's very well said. Uh, the non-DOM tax regime, for those not familiar, remittance-based system, you have money overseas, good way to you know, dramatically reduce your tax. I'm sure people, plenty of people paying in the single digits of tax. Uh, that's very unfair that someone who made all their money somewhere else, their business is somewhere else, their employees are somewhere else, how dare they come and live here and pay something, probably more than the average person pays. But yes. now it's over. Yes, it's over. I mean, the non-DOM thing has worked very well for this country. Uh, there are some that perceive it as being unfair. Uh, but look, uh, we, the top 1% of taxpayers in Britain, and the non-DOMs are part of that, the top 1% of taxpayers in Britain pay 30% of all tax revenues. That is a very important number. Still less than the US. Still a very, yes, but it's still a very important very number. Very important. Um, and if you get rid of rich people, if the non-doms decide to leave, if the entrepreneurs decide to base themselves, you know, in Dubai or Dublin or wherever it may be, um, that doesn't help the poorer in society. You know, and, 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 and again, these are arguments of leadership. You know, it's all well and good for the Labour Party to say what they say. And now, and now Jeremy Hunt, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, we can't have these rich people they must pay more tax. Well, they don't pay more tax. They leave. Yeah, if you're a non-dime, you're probably not from here. And why? In many, in most. In most cases. Most cases. In some, most cases. Some, yes. In most cases. In yeah. most cases, you know, I live in different places. If someone, someone said, I'm going to charge you 69% tax. At a certain level, there's no place on earth that's worth paying 69%. Maybe at, a, maybe at some level, when you make 10, 20, 100 million. No, even so. No, no, even so. Even so, whatever you make, sure. you know, the tax, it, it, it has to be seen. Taxation rates, whether they're on earned income or investment income, whatever they may be, taxation rates have to be seen to be fair and reasonable. When they are fair and reasonable, in general, most people are happy to pay them. We're getting to the point where they're not fair and reasonable, and people are now looking to leave, and they 
are leaving. And I had a, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the north of England. I was doing my TV show on GB News. And I, and I have a segment where I allow the audience on live TV just to come and ask questions. It's incredibly high risk, but it's great fun. But there was a young lad, a uh, young lad, he must have been 19 or 20. And he said, Mr. Farage, it, it was on non doms. You know, why should these very rich people be allowed to live in this country and pay reduced taxation rates? And I could see the anger in him. Why? Real, yeah. uh, whether it's envy, yeah. whether it's a sense of why have I got nothing and not many prospects living here in the northwest of England, whatever it was. Um, and I really, really tried. I said, look, if we don't have rich people, if we don't have people paying lots and lots, tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds of tax every year, who do you think is funding your local hospital? Who do you think is funding the school your kids might go to in a few years' time? And, and I felt in that exchange with him, I was beginning to win him over. Again, these are arguments that need to be made by politicians. At the moment, there is a dearth, an absence of anybody prepared to make those arguments. And that, to me, is the biggest challenge that you have, is that he says, people who are paying a lot more, it's the culture of envy. Yes. Because, um, because how much more hospital do they get? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and we are going to have a Labour government. You know, Labour will win the next general election. They will win it by quite a big majority. Now, is it, I saw that they, 400 seats? Well, I mean, who's to say we're a long way off? Yeah, okay. You know, and, 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 and predicting exactly the number of seats is a bit like picking the winner at the 3.30 at Newmarket this afternoon. <laughs> you know, it's not that easy. Um, but there will be a Labour government. Um, ironically, if the Labour government has a small majority, there'll be more left wing. If they have a big majority, the hard element can actually be kind of watered down and not hold the sort of, you know, sort of Damocles over Sir Keir Starmer's head. Uh, but we've had 14 years of so-called Conservative government. The tax burden now in this country is the highest it's been since 1948. And that was after a war that literally bankrupted us, you know. We bankrupted ourselves to save the freedom of Europe and they've never thanked us, but never mind, that's another story. Um, and, and the tax burden goes up. Um, entrepreneurship goes down, uh, productivity goes down, the quality of life goes down, and GDP per capita goes down. You know, we are not in a great place. Even on, for me here as a tourist, no more uh, VAT refund. I know. Why would you, you come and buy a watch, come and buy a bag, you get nothing. No, no, I mean, and this Why was, would you come here? This was part of the trust budget. Part of the trust budget when I was with you last was to say, give foreigners a refund if they want to buy, you know, a watch or some, some sort of high end. Uh, uh, no, 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 that's all wrong. It's been nice to the rich. So we'll say no to the money, make the poor pay more in taxes, and they can go to Frankfurt or Paris and buy their watches. I mean, it's madness. My theory in this is, you're saying, you know, back in the late 80s, you wouldn't move to Kuala Lumpur. All these new places were not options for people to go. There was no Dubai. Nope. Are these politicians just stuck in that era where, you know, I always say California's governor would say, where are you going to go? You have to buy your watch here. There's a hundred places you can buy your watch here. I, I feel like they're stuck in that. Yeah, well, look at California. Where are you going to go? Well, look at, look at California. You know, they've, they've fled to Dallas in Texas, to Austin in Texas, to Colorado, to Miami. You know, people do move. Um, why? I think it's a lack of moral courage. I think that political leadership is about being ahead of where public opinion is at a moment in time. And you say to the populace, this is where we are. But I think this is where we need to get to. And here's why. And here's why. And it's the art of persuasion. It's the art of saying, this is a better path to take than sitting still in the middle of the road where we are now. And great leaders do that. Thatcher was a great leader in that sense. And to be fair to him, Blair was as well. Blair never hid what he was doing. 
Blair would come out and tell the British public, we're going to war in Iraq and here's the reason why. Now, we, we may question the reason why later. Um, and I suppose to some extent I was in a way, because, you know, when I was saying we're stuck inside this political union in Europe, it's denuding us of our sovereignty, of our, our birthright, in a sense, to govern ourselves, and that's why we need to leave. Uh, when I was propagating that, I mean, this was, this was a minority sport. <laughs> I mean, it really was. But I was consistent in that view, and gradually, by encouraging people to go in that direction, people did, and we got a majority that endorsed it. But I'm afraid the Western world is full of political figures who are in politics for a career, as opposed to being in it for a calling, and they will mirror where the focus group is today to say, I'm in touch with who, the people. Who are the real leaders today? Across the Western world, there are very, very few. Um, I would argue, whether you love him or hate him, that Viktor Orban is a strong national leader in Hungary. Right. You know, there is a, he, he believes in a Hungarian identity, <coughs> that, it, that it should be protected. Um, and, you know, you might say he's a bit authoritarian, but he's a strong leader. And I, and you know, this may be controversial, but I, I make no bones about it. You know, Donald Trump is a friend of mine. And for all his New Yorkness, you know, for all he's out there, and sometimes, yeah, I get it, he's a bit brash, he can be a bit loud. You know what, New Yorkers are just a bit like that. Uh, but I do think that Trump proved to be on the world stage a very good leader. I think that the Abraham Accords were an incredible achievement. I think getting Arab states to sign accords on, on, on peace and on trade with Israel was an incredible global achievement. Uh, and the fact that Saudi Arabia were about to join that club is, I believe, the reason that Hamas launched that attack on the 7th of October last year. You know, worried that Trump may come back into the White House, worried that Saudi Arabia might start to join that pact. Um, I think that was a big success. I think that, I think that what he did in conjunction with some of the Republican governors of the states in America with uh, what we call, you know, in textbook terms, supply-side reforms. I mean, Georgia, you know, the state of Georgia, you know, for two or three years in a row was averaging 4.4% growth rates. Incredible. But it proves the point. If you lift the burden of regulation off the backs of ordinary folk, if you say to them, look, get out there, take a risk, have a go, they'll do it. But I'm sorry to say that, you know, rather like your comment earlier, is this what the public want? No, this isn't even part of the national conversation at the moment. I, I think to your point, you don't have any leadership. People, they follow the polls, they don't create the polls. That's right. And, and, and it, it's remarkable how human beings respond to good leadership, to strong leadership. Mm. It's remarkable. People want to be inspired. Yeah. They don't want to be cheesed off. They don't want to be upset. Was Thatcher the last to do that here? Thatcher's job was to smash a broken model. And a lot of eggs had to be shattered to make that omelette. So it was a very attritional, tough battle against an established status quo uh, that was deep within the trade union movement, uh, deep within uh, the media. Um, it was a heck of a tough job. But I think after six or seven years of it, we did begin to glimpse the sunlit uplands of where we needed to go. It was, uh, it was almost like national chemotherapy. Mm. Very, very tough treatment, but to cure a disease, and we did it. Um, as I say, Blair, I don't like the Blairite reforms, but at least Blair was honest in terms of where, you know, where the country is going. Um, Blair was the first Labour leader to say, we don't mind people getting rich. The problem was... That was the zeitgeist of that time. That was yeah, not Bill Clinton. But they weren't Clinton. getting rich as entrepreneurs. Yeah. They were getting rich in the public sector. In the crony capitalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. that, and that was the problem with it. So leadership is rare. Uh, I believe that Trump, divisive again, though he may be, I, I do believe that Trump is an important Western leader. And I think in a world... Uh, where we have a war going on in the Middle East, a war going on in Ukraine. Uh, goodness knows what the Chinese may do with Taiwan. 
uh, now or in the years to come, I think, I, think he, I think he would give the West good leadership. What do you make of what's uh, going on with all the trials? Half a billion dollars? Well, I, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, the Letitia James case in New York is- It's a civil fraud trial. It's a civil fraud trial. There is no victim. The argument is that he borrowed money from the banks to finance projects on the basis of inflated valuations of his existing properties. This is a victimless crime in every sense, in that the banks got every cent of their money back, plus the interest that was negotiated in those deals. And Letitia James, who was elected on a ticket of I'm gonna get Trump, I mean, talk about politicized judiciary, um, valued Mar-a-Lago at $18 million. Well, I was in Mar-a-Lago last Monday, and I was in Mar-a-Lago a fortnight before. I love Mar-a-Lago, I mean, it's amazing. Um, I reckon the Century Hut's worth $18 million. I mean, what's Mar-a-Lago worth? A billion? More? A billion? I have no idea. Wow. It's, it must be the best piece of real estate in the whole of Florida. You've got this magnificent Mar-a-Lago, built in the 1920s. I call it the Versailles of America. Historical. Historical, but beautiful. And then you've got the beach club with the most incredible access to a beautiful piece of beach. I mean, I tell you what, I reckon it would sell for a billion dollars tomorrow. I'm probably undervaluing it. And yet, she used a valuation of $18 million. So what you can, I mean, how is that different? How is that different to what Putin does? To his opponents. This is the utter politicization of the American judiciary. It is sad. And I tell you something, if America falls, the entirety of Western civilization falls. Why do you, why do you feel that way? Western civilization? Well, uh, America is the dominant culture. In the West? In the West. And the most important military pillar of the NATO structure which whatever its faults may be, you know, has been around now for nearly three quarters of a century. And I worry about America. I worry about social decline. I worry about what's happening in American cities. I worry what's happening on the American border. I worry about increased lawlessness. I just walk around New York. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It's back to where it was when I was a kid. In the, uh, in the 70s. I remember it when I was a kid. Yeah. And it was a dangerous, awful place. Who the hell wanted to go there? Bookers and Times Square and... Everything was ghastly, you know, and, 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 and it turned around. So you see, things can go through bad periods, but they can also go through good periods. Right now, the West is going through a bad period. Right now, the West is denuded of good leadership, of good direction and of any fundamental understanding of what economies are all about. And national debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The world's in conflict. I mean, are you surprised that crypto is doing what it's doing? Are you surprised that the gold price is doing what it's doing? You know, investors are saying there are alarm bells. This is fruit of all the same tree. People are fed up people and they are, want alternatives. I think they're scared. They're worried. Okay. I think people are worried yeah. about where we're going. And that's why, that's why these alternative investments have flourished, I think, in the last few months in the way in which they have, and there's no sign of that stopping. For me, to, to talk about what we do, yeah. having some kind of passport outside of this Western world, I, I would surmise, perhaps, you know, among the Western world, the US is important. I wonder how much of an impact in Thailand or in Argentina, where they have the new president, I wonder how much of the impact some impact, no doubt, if the U.S. falls. And I don't know that the U.S. entirely collapses. No, I don't but, mean it quite but, in that way. But, uh, you know, I, 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 to me, I feel, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If you're in Montenegro, if you're in Argentina, it's probably a little bit less of a ripple because those places have never been as connected. No, that's right. And they're not part of the Western club in quite the same way that the rest of us are. Um, I think Argentina is fascinating. And I think the, the man with the chainsaw, um, <laughs> uh, the funny hairstyle, um, I tell you what, that's leadership. That's leadership. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here's what we're going to do. Oh, yeah. It's not going to be popular at first. 
And, and these guys always get in, and then it's like, can you believe he didn't appoint every, you know, deputy ambassador? It's like, yeah, that's what he told you he was going to do. He is amazing. And, I mean, this is like Thatcherism on steroids. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Cutting and slashing public expenditure, doing all the things that he's done. Um, I've really, really got my fingers crossed for him and for Argentina. I really have, and I'm beginning to, I mean, I know this is not an investment show, but I'm beginning to think about buying Argentinian bonds as an investment. You, let's move to Argentina. Yeah. No, no, well, I, you know, yeah, but you see, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> I, I get it, I in. get it, I get it. I mean, you know, because I have emotional ties, you know, I like cricket and things like that. No, I mean, look, you know, what he is doing is amazing. And, and I'd love to sit here with you in two years time. We both say, wow, yeah. this worked. I think he's got a better than 50% chance of, turning, of succeeding, of turning Argentina around. He, he, he did say we should take the Falklands back. Did well, we'll have to deal with him on that one. <laughs> By the way, they never had the Falklands. Let's take them at the first they place. They never, ever had the Falklands. One of the great misnomers with all of, of this. the Argentine, the leaving the comments uh, right now. <laughs> they never had the Falklands, um, but I'm sure we can do a deal with them on that. A little local scuttlebutt. You're on, uh, you're on GB News. Yeah. Is this like the Fox News of, of the UK? What, what is this like? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it is a challenger to the established broadcasters. To the BBC. We've got the BBC, we've got Sky, and a okay. bit of ITV. Um, Rupert Murdoch, shortly after GB News launched, launched Talk TV, Talk TV yeah. with Piers Morgan as the superstar, uh, the highly paid superstar. Talk TV is now closing. Piers has gone. And GB News goes on from strength to strength. Uh, I could show you numbers for 50% uh, of the last two weeks, where my evening show from 7 till 8 gets more live viewers than the BBC, Sky and Talk added up together. So we are doing really, really well. We've been the fastest growing news website in Britain for the last 10 months in a row. Uh, yeah, we're doing really, really well. If people are so fed up with the BBC, for example, why wouldn't a, a talk TV with, with Piers Moore? I thought he's the, the controversial guy. He yeah. speaks up for what he believes in. No, Piers Morgan's controversial for the sake of being controversial. <laughs> he, he's, he's, uh, I, I hear that. It's always Meghan Markle, that's what I hear. Yeah, about. but he wants to insert himself into whatever the big controversy of the day is. Uh, for opinion television to work, you actually have to have a consistent opinion and view that runs through everything you do. And he, does, he, you know, he just doesn't have that. And maybe he's not quite as popular with the general public as he perhaps himself thought that he was. So, yeah, we're doing very, very well on the numbers. We're doing very, very well on the influence. Where we're still struggling is an advertising boycott from day one from many of the big advertisers you know, on the basis that we could be too right wing. Now, I mean, what is right wing? Right wing is just where the centre ground was 20 years ago. So commercially still a really big challenge, but um, in broadcasting terms, you're going very well indeed. You had, uh, since we spoke, a little issue with a uh, bank account. Yes, just a little bit. Um, amazing, actually. Uh, I'd been with the NatWest Group, Britain's biggest bank, for 43 years. They bought uh, Coots. And Coots was a part of yeah. that banking group. It was sort of the posh bit. The Queen's Bank. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And they debanked me, you know, gave me notice we're closing everything down in a few weeks. And I had a real problem with that. And I went out onto the high street and elsewhere and was refused by 10 other banks. Completely refused by 10 other banks. And I was going through a period of, I must be honest, some panic about this. I mean, it really very scary period. And I just thought, you know what? I've got nothing to lose here. I'm going to go public. And I was able to get from the bank through a thing called a subject access request, the notes on my file about why I'd been debanked, and I did not align with the values of the bank. I dared to question net zero policy. You know, I supported Brexit. I might be funded by the Russians. I, I mean, quite extraordinary stuff. Um, people saying, 
people within the bank saying things like, have we forced him out of the country? I hope so. I'd like to push him out of a moving car. I mean, the whole thing was just monstrous. And it just exploded as a story last July. I mean, and people was, said, no, he's making it up. Yeah, people did say I was making it up, but once I published the internal documents, the legal inter you know, legally obtained internal documents of the bank, nobody could then uh, complain or pretend. And then they made it worse because the chief executive of the bank leaked details of my account to the BBC, uh, claiming I hadn't got enough money to justify an account. That all exploded. It's resulted in the CEO of NatWest going, the CEO of Coots Bank going, uh, the government promising this summer it will pass legislation to say that nobody should be debanked on the basis of, the, of their legally held to opinion. your devil's just to play devil's advocate i mean free market capitalism does the bank have to offer banking services to someone well it's a very interesting point and i and i pondered that very heavily but i think that in the modern world uh, banking services are as essential as water and gas you literally can't survive without them can't hold cash around here anymore well this is also, you know, what the campaign broadened into. The, the push for a cashless society, the link from that into central bank digital currencies, which the British government want to introduce with the Bank of England in 2030, albeit in the experimental form to begin with. But you can see the direction in which we're going and the the drive to a cashless society, you know, businesses that, you know, if you're running a fish counter, you know, your average sale is eight quid, nine quid, people give you a tenner, yeah. you know, and you want to try and bank your, your cash, but you can't because the local branch is closed. They don't want your cash. <clears throat> the fact that up to a million people have been debanked in the last four years in Britain. So what really happened with me is most people get debanked. You were the voice. Most people, they're too ashamed. Uh -huh to admit it. I'm, right. And actually in their internal notes, Coote said, we should be okay. He won't go public. It'll be too embarrassing for him. Well, you know what? They took on the wrong bloke. And as soon as I put my head over the parapet, lots of other people appeared saying, yep, they've done it to us. It seems like the ultimate leadership, because I was thinking earlier when you mentioned leadership, to me, one of the, maybe the number one thing you need in human communication is consistency. Yes. And these people don't understand because they're not authentic, the bankers and the corporate, the yeah. corporate hacks that we both so dislike. They don't understand that the authenticity of being able, being out, being able to go out there and say it. I have people who work for me. Oh, what if, what if this were to happen? I, I, I'd go out and talk about it. Yeah. And, and the people that care would, yeah. would understand. They don't, they don't get that. They don't get that. So it was, it, it really wasn't. It, it, it was funny enough. In some ways, it was almost as big as Brexit. It just exploded. We had 38 front pages of British newspapers in three weeks. It just dominated things. Uh, and, and the public response I got was amazing. Sort of 50% of the emails that I, of the tens of thousands of emails that I received would begin with, Dear Mr. Farage, I don't normally agree with you, but <laughs> you know, this was a very uniting issue. So I get the point, uh, you know, about, about you know, uh, uh, does a, a provider in a free market have to provide a service? But I think banking... And I'll tell you why it's different. We bailed them out. In 2008, we bailed them out. Tens of billions of pounds of our tax money bailed out the NatWest Bank to their greed and stupidity. So do they have to provide us with a service? Yes. That, that is the problem, by the way. And I, I don't know if we agree in this, but you know, with government paid health care. Oh, that sounds great. I'm paying, I'm paying more taxes. An American might say, I'll go to Europe. I'll, sure, I'll pay a lot of taxes, but at least I get health care. By the way, okay, at least you're getting something for your money. But it comes to a point eventually when it's the same situation. Oh, well, uh, how many sodas did you have or how much salt did you have? Maybe we have to ration the health care now. In the same way, uh, isn't that kind of what happened with the with the banks? We have to step in, so now we have to control. So you just ruin the whole system. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, in any capitalist system, you have to let people go bust. And it shows you how far we've moved away from capitalism, that we came and bailed the banks out in the way in which yeah. we did. And, and if you have a regulatory regime that makes it too expensive and too difficult for newcomers to get banking licenses, what do you expect? Well, that's the other point, right? 
if you look at a lot of the Western European countries, all the fintechs, there are some here, there are some yes, fintechs are. here, but a lot of them go to what, Lithuania and, uh, and elsewhere. I mean, look, too hard. Good, good luck to the fintechs. But the, uh, you know, good luck to the fintechs, but, but the fintechs can't provide a lot of basic services. You, you brought, and actually, this is one yes, I, uh, that we agreed on, because we have digital nomads who watch us, and they get a little bit of money, and, and they use the fintech. Yeah. It's not as robust if you're running a, a business, if you have a lot of you know, deep financial needs. No, and it doesn't, and, and you know, they can't pay you interest on current balances. I think some do now. Very maybe, not, maybe not here. Very, very, very few. Uh, they can't do loans. And that's a problem because, you know, any business has a cash flow issue from time to time. You may need to take a sort of temporary, you know, 100 grand loan to keep the business going for a few weeks or whatever. If you weren't paying these crazy high taxes, you, you could set that money aside and, and loan it back to yourself. Well, that's true. No, I know. I don't disagree with Go you. Go where you're treated best. You know. No, look, it, 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 you know, I mean, I mean, the banks have been a classic example of, of, as I say, you know, we bail them out when they're in trouble and they give us absolutely nothing back. And, and, and you know, what the Farage banking, debanking scandal has done is to open up a very big debate about banks and what they're for. The government have promised to put legislation in place, and I'm going to keep an eye on them to make sure they do. You think did. they'll do it? I think they are so desperate to do anything that might make them popular that, yes, they probably will. What's going on with uh, safety here? We're hearing, I just told you I was in uh, Colombia, and people who've lived there, I, I, quite frankly, I don't feel unsafe there. People who've lived there their entire lives, don't wear your watch around. Like, don't, 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 you know, don't use your phone. Uh, you're saying it's uh, some of the same here in parts of London. It's, it's exploding, and, you know, you can be walking down Oxford Street on a mobile phone, chap on a moped comes up and just takes it out of your hand. That happens every day, hundreds of times. Um, in the wealthier parts of London, Ken and Chelsea, um, uh, some of the robberies and burglaries are now very violent, very unpleasant. You know, people are followed back from an expensive restaurant. Uh, they're in a car, they're in a taxi, whatever, and they put the key in the door, and before they open the door, someone's boom on them. I was in a... Uh, private members club in uh, the West End in Marleybone uh, not long ago. There was a prominent member, quite a well-known man, who had a sort of big, chunky Rolex on. And even though his driver was waiting room opposite the other side of the street, the doorman said, uh, sir, would you take that off, please? I really don't think you should leave this club wearing that. What do you mean? The car's only... No, no, no. They'll follow you. They follow you, They'll follow and it's you. very interesting. Um, Denmark last Thursday published some figures of the percentage of crimes conducted in Denmark that led to convictions by nationality. Mm. Now we're entering onto thin ice here. It was extraordinary. You had to go. You had to go down about ten or eleven nationalities before you got to Dames. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone that lives in Iraq or Afghanistan or Romania or Syria are bad people. And that, of course, is how mainstream media would twist the comments that I'm making now. What it means is when you live with lax open borders, when you live with a system where people who come into a country illegally, 99% of them are allowed to stay, you become a very soft touch for criminal gangs. And most of the criminality in London uh, that has risen in the way that it has is being conducted by foreign criminal gangs who very recently come to Britain. And that is the brutal truth of where we are. And absolutely nobody in mainstream media existing old mainstream media or politics is prepared to confront it. And why is that? Gutlessness. No leadership. Weakness, fear of being criticized, fear of being condemned, <clears throat> fear of what these comments might mean for their own personal safety, all of those things. You know, and, and you only have to look at the pro-Palestine marches that we've seen in London again and again and again and just recently the absolute betrayal of Israel by the British government where we vote at the UN for a complete unconditional ceasefire for the whole of Ramadan 
just to give Hamas a chance to rebuild. You're, uh, this is one thing with the UK and Ireland uh, seem very, very opposed on. Ireland seems to be one of the most pro-Palestinian mm. countries in Europe. What do you make of that? Yes, yeah, true. It's true. They are. And, and we have traditionally been, of course, one of the most pro-Israeli. I mean, don't forget the Balfour Declaration mm. was a British declaration back in 1917 that helped establish the principle you know, of Israel becoming, coming into being as a state. Uh, yeah, Irish nationalism has always been associated with Palestinian. They see a parallel, a very false parallel in my view, um, as, as, as to what's happening. But we now tolerate, we now tolerate uh, large numbers of people uh, on the streets of London, uh, parroting, chanting slogans that are terrorist, chanting slogans that are frankly not very far away from being genocidal in their sentiment. And yet if you turn up to launch a counter protest, you'll have six coppers knock you to the floor and put you in handcuffs. So this stuff is very, very disturbing. Very, very disturbing indeed. It's very controversial. Well, it, the West is the West is is pivoting, I think, don't you? Yes, I feel on that, that issue. I fear that it is. And I think there's a younger generation who have no understanding or perhaps even belief that the Holocaust was the end game of many centuries of you know pogroms of terrible things being done to Jewish populations. The younger population almost don't believe it, um, have no connection with it. And the advance of radical Islam through many of our public institutions and the fear that any criticism of it will lead to you being branded at best or at worst face physical abuse has really, really moved the needle. Let's talk about where, again, our event, Nomad Capitalist Live in yeah. Malaysia, a Muslim country, something that turns people away. One thing I always tell people is that what I've been told, and we've had people who are women, people who are of color, people yeah. who are gay. Yeah. I go there, I talk to people, you know, we have our own code of conduct for ourselves, the Malay Muslims. Obviously, there's also Malaysian Chinese, there's Malaysian Indian. Even they, you know, do their own thing. For us, we have our own parameters. You do what you want. You see a very liberal Muslim country. I think yeah. that's, that's odd to a lot of people in the West who think I Muslim know, country. I know, there is a lack of understanding here. I mean, look, I, I was in Marrakesh last year during Ramadan. Yeah. I was really interested talking to the drivers, the bartenders, the waiters about Ramadan, what it meant for them. Um, I saw a day when people flocked to the mosque and the wealthier people in the village were giving money to the poorer people in the village. Uh, I, you know, I talked to bartenders who said, you know, to us, Ramadan really matters because we suffer a little bit. And, it may, and that makes us think of others who are suffering. I thought, wow, mm. this really is an incredibly caring, peaceful religion that, the, that these men and women are following yeah. and adhering to. Um, so we, you know, there is a responsibility on people like me too to deal with this issue correctly. Yeah, and, and to brand anybody of the Muslim religion as being dangerous and it would be a huge... Some of the kindest people you, in no, Malaysia. No, no, there's yeah. no question about that. Yeah. Um, the worry is the radicalization that has come in to parts of that religion, uh, the fact that the religion itself doesn't have a leader is part of a problem. You know, the Catholic Church has the Pope. What's left of my church, the Church of England, has the Archbishop of Canterbury. The fact there is not a sort of leader overall of the Muslim religion itself, I think, is one of the difficulties. Uh, many argue for a reformation to take place. But no, 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 no. We mustn't get this wrong. The vast majority of people who, are, who follow the Muslim faith are very, very good people. But there's a hardcore in this country and many other Western countries that has been growing over the last few years that lives with a total non-acceptance of our way of life and a strong belief that they must impose their way of life upon us. And that is the biggest cultural issue internally uh, that we've probably ever faced. What do you say to other people here in Britain who complain that as a result of Brexit, their passport is now less valuable. They cannot just turn up and live anywhere in Europe. Good, good, good. 
There's now a passport key that says British passport holders, as it always should have been. Um, the fact that it said European Union on the beginning of it showed the sheer devaluation of our national identity that was represented by being a member of the European Union. And that British passport is more respected around the world than one that first said European Union upon it. Um, the irony, of course, is, and the frustration, of course, is, that whilst we've got that back and, and there's, a more, there's a more stringent degree of border controls both ways, which is a mild inconvenience, whilst all that's happened, we've allowed all these boats to cross the English Channel with illegals, which is driving people slightly mad. No, and, and that leads on to foreign policy. I mean, you know, as members of the European Union, increasingly our foreign policy was tied to what their foreign policy was. What you've seen since Brexit is a British government stand up uh, and do the AUKUS deal, the nuclear submarine deal with Australia and the Americans. We could, and that really went over and above the French who had an existing diesel submarine deal, ours is nuclear, um, that wouldn't have happened as members of the European Union. On Ukraine, whether you agree with the policy or not, Boris Johnson was the Western leader who absolutely pushed for sending money, sending munitions, helping Ukraine. We wouldn't have done that as members of the European Union. So we are standing on the world stage a lot taller than we were prior to Brexit, and that passport is more valuable than it was before. It's just travelling around Europe is a tinsy-wincy bit more inconvenient. Well, they say we can't move to Spain anymore. They can get a residence <laughs> permit as a third country national. They can do that. But we can't just turn up. We have to do whatever the conditions that yeah, an fine. American would, a Canadian would. Yeah, well, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Look, you know, when you, when you change things, when you fundamentally change things, some things become easier and some things become a little bit more difficult. You know, importing goods from the rest of the world can become a lot easier. Importing goods from Europe becomes a little bit more difficult. That's what change is. That's what disruption is. Things don't stay exactly the same. And there are Brits who've got that mindset, who prefer Europe to Britain. And, but look, they're a tiny minority. You think so? Oh, I know so. Most people who voted Remain didn't do so for some love of the European project or they wanted to fly the European Union flag from their front door. They did so because it was the status quo. In any system, any business system, any scientific system, any political system, the status quo is a very, very powerful thing. In a Milton Friedman once said, the tyranny of the status quo. And I meet people every day, well, no, I, you know, I voted Remain because I, you know, I got a mortgage or I was a bit worried about, you know. There, there was, you know. So the number of people you'll meet genuinely upset that we haven't got free movement across Europe is relatively small. Coming from the U.S. and, and with the, having had that passport where there's nowhere else you can go without going through the third country process, mm. I, I understand the rationale. You, you think like, if someone doesn't feel like they belong in the UK, do we want to hold? I always thought the UK was better because you go to the US embassy and they were grouchy and they didn't, in fact, they served. I lived some places where you go to the British embassy, they had a high tea for the expats every month. I'm like, this is how it, this is how it should be. <laughs> yeah, look, you know, I, I, it was interesting, you know, you mentioned embassies. We were actually closing embassies around the world and being replaced by European... To rely on other EU... A European embassy. Union embassy. Yeah, yeah. And we're now re-establishing British embassies. Now, look, at every level, Brexit was the right thing to do. I believe that 100%. I'm frustrated by the implementation in this country. I'm frustrated that it's not led to deregulation. I'm frustrated we haven't broken away from some of the craziness, as I see it, of European rules. But you know what? We're in charge. Constitutionally, that won't change. Labour may keep us aligned to EU rules for the next five years or whatever it may be, but we are freed from that thing. We've made the biggest constitutional change we've made for over 300 years. And the fact that I was one of the progenitors of that is something I'm very proud of. There was some scuttlebutt, I suppose, people just talking online. What if the, what if, uh, the UK decides they want to rejoin and would they be allowed to keep the pound? Or what, what's the, what's yeah. the chance of that happening? We ain't rejoining. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. And the cost of rejoining would be, of course, joining the euro and many other things. It won't happen. That would be the cost. Yeah, it the won't pound happen. would have to go. Of course, it won't happen. It won't happen. And, you know, without your own currency, without control of your own borders, you're not a sovereign country. Do you have to join the Schengen area? They'd make us... Yeah, if, if we were to rejoin, yeah. 
you know, we, we would literally have to be, you know, on our knees begging and, <laughs> and accepting all their conditions. That isn't going to happen. That isn't the debate. The debate is, do we stay aligned to EU rules or do we break away in an attempt to become more competitive? That's the debate. And what's interesting to me is uh, I, I don't follow all the immigration stuff here in the U.S. in terms of, you know, but what I do know is if I want to come here and start a business, we talked about this two years ago, it's yeah. very, very difficult for me to get a residence permit. Uh, the, at the beginning of the war, the, uh, the investor visa, formerly tier one, was canceled. Yeah. There's no way for me to make an investment or to start a business. It's a normal business, a successful business, a tax-paying business. There's no way for me to do that and come and live here. Uh, there are ways, but it's very difficult. It, they're difficult, and, and they reject a good number of people. Yeah, and they're expensive, and many don't qualify. And they want kind of the next yeah. Facebook. What if you have a business that makes 10 million pounds a year? Yeah, look, we're in the wrong place in all of this. We're in the wrong place in all of this. Uh, we need to be competitive. We need to encourage people to invest in the country. And in fact, what we're doing through the tax system and the regulatory system is we're telling people, please don't come and please go away. It's madness. That's what you would hoped would be achieved, is that you would use this to bring in more people, the right people? Well, the right people. You know, not, not mass immigration of unskilled labour, because all that's done is drive down productivity, made the quality of life worse in the country. I mean, remember this. Blair comes to power, right, in 97. The population's 58 million. It's now 68 million, but it's not. We all know it's well over 70, because the sheer number of people that have come illegally. And economically, this doesn't work. This model of unskilled labour en masse does not work. What does work is small-scale immigration numerically, but with high skill sets and high tax revenues. And that's the kind of immigration that Britain needs. I will say I got my hair cut today by an Albanian woman down the street. And I, t I take a little bit of umbrage with you. I think you, you talk about the Albanians coming in. Mm. Some of the most beautiful women probably anywhere <laughs> in the world. I don't know what you're complaining about. I'm not sure that excuses everything, but yes. Well, no, no, the Albanian thing, levity. no, the Albanian thing was a joke. Albanians were claiming asylum here, crossing the channel in dinghies and claiming asylum here. I mean, this is a, you know, a NATO country, an applicant member of the European Union. They shouldn't be claiming asylum. That was ludicrous. I, I, to that point, I remember when you were with us in Mexico City, we had five Georgians out of six who tried to come, mm -hmm. who, because there's some some dolts from the from the village that go and claim asylum or that go to Mexico and then try and run into the U.S., oh, we don't want any joy. You can be the chief financial officer of a company, but they don't differentiate. And, and so, I mean, that to me is what stands out, is that it hurts the good people who have that passport. Yeah, no, no. I mean, look, we are living in a world well, let's face it, those who have the money and those who have the entrepreneurial ability you know, are relatively free to move around the world. Have choice. Have choices. And you're here to provide choices and, and advice and guidance to those people. And this may be terribly unfair, but the truth is that ability to move freely at will just cannot be available to two or three billion people in the world. It just can't, it won't work, it doesn't work. Even the specimens we've seen of it, of a couple of million that have crossed the Mediterranean, have led to all sorts of social dislocation across Europe. Now, it's an unfair world. It always was an unfair world. Those with brains, those with ability, those with money, those perhaps in some cases through accidents of birth, do have greater opportunities than everybody else. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's good, it just happens to be a fact. And yet I would argue that, you know, if you look at our company, we have 82 people now, no one's in the US where I'm from, I think a couple people from the UK, but they also left, maybe for lower cost of living somewhere else, maybe better weather. Uh, and I seem to think that that's the way you gotta, you gotta solve this, is you have to provide opportunities for people where you go there and there's talented people everywhere. And maybe yeah. they want to stay in their own country. And I think that what I see, I don't know about Iraq or Syria that you mentioned, but I know about Eastern Europe, for example. It seems like there's a lot of people that 
hey, if there's an opportunity, I'd rather stay here. Well, I think actually what will happen in Poland is lots of people will go back. I think, I think Poland is... Beca- Their wages are, are Poland's approaching... Em- Poland's emerging. Yeah. Poland's emerging, you know, as a growing, successful country yeah. uh, that's kept its, it's kept its national identity quite strictly. It's on the up. And yeah, people will start going back. Are you less bullish now that they, uh, they had a very kind of Orban like uh, the Law and Justice Party? Are you a little bit less bullish that they're now out? Well, they've got Mr. Tusk now as their prime He's minister. Mr. Brussels, who, right? Who, yeah, well, he and I sort of crossed swords a few times in the European Parliament, but you know, he, he, he is back as prime minister of a country. Uh, he won't be stupid. You know, he, he, he knows that Poles value identity, value borders. I want to keep this thing on an even keel. Um, so he's not going to be uh, quite as left wing as people think. A couple uh, names. What are your thoughts? Kate Middleton in the news. Well, I mean, I, ad- adorable Kate, you know. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, she is the classiest act now in the royal family. There's no question about it. She's amazing. Just her behavior, her demeanor, her genuine kindness, and obviously going through a very, very tough time. Uh, the media and the trolls were pretty vile to her after that photograph. And then when we get the statement from her last Friday, uh, quite a dramatic emotional statement that she does have cancer and that she's having, you know, preventative chemotherapy, uh, at least it shut the trolls up for a little bit. So I pray, you know, for, the, for her return to full health. I'm optimistic that she will return to full health. It, I'll tell you a funny thing about the royal family that I don't think people from outside this country can quite understand. We live our lives through the royal family. When they have a happy occasion, it reminds us of happy occasions in our life. When they have a death, it reminds us of deaths in our own family. We literally live through them. And our emotional connection over the course of the last two or three years to the royal family has been quite extraordinary. I mean, I can't even tell you. On the 8th of September, when the Queen died, 2022, when the Queen died, I mean, I, I, Andrew, I felt very, very emotional about it. I did, and tens of millions of Brits did. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I shed a tear over that. It really, wow, and I'm pretty English. You know, (laughs) it really got to me. Um, And the rest of the world are fascinated. America's fascinated by the royal family but it's because we literally live our lives through them. It's an extraordinary thing. Harry and Meghan? <clears throat> yes. Well, um, <laughs> there are always members of the family you'd rather not see again. Um, and, uh, oh, appalling behaviour. Disgusting, appalling behaviour. The level of disrespect that Harry showed to his late grandmother I thought was an absolute disgrace. Uh, the trashing of his own brother, of his father, of his father's now wife, the Queen, Camilla. Uh, you may have your arguments mm. you know, with your dad. I mean, you, you, know, you may have your own bust-ups, uh, but you keep those in a private room. You don't air them to the world, and you certainly don't sell them for money in a book. Did you see Chris Christie's uh, story of meeting uh, Harry? I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> he gave him a picture of himself. <laughs> don't, don't open it until later. Uh, uh, Study Khan, you said he's going to win again, Mayor of London. Yes, he will. Are we worse off for it here? Oh, Khan's been terrible. Um, Khan's been terrible. I've been under Khan's watch. Knife crimes exploded. Watch was stolen, I heard, actually. You know, so. you know, <laughs> I mean, awful. And, and Khan's bias is incredible. I mean, you know, he's the first to scream Islamophobia. And yet, when Palestinian protesters flash up on the Elizabeth Tower that holds Big Ben, one of the great national symbols, from the river to the sea, uh, not a single arrest took place and no criticism from Khan. So a very biased mayor of London, but he'll win again because the British Conservatives are now in a total downward spiral and haven't even got the will to win. It's a reform party now. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I led the Brexit party and we won the 2019 European elections in dramatic style, getting double the votes of the nearest party. It was quite, quite a good moment. Um, and then the 31st of January 2020 came 
little did we know that the pandemic was just around the corner. Um, that was the day we left the European Union. And I said, you know what? I'm out of here. I've done my bit. I've done my bit. So I rebranded the party as Reform UK. No point being called the Brexit party anymore because Brexit was done. And I gave the leadership down to Richard Tice, who's taken it over. I'm the honorary president. I have no full active role, executive role in the party, but I'm sort of a sort of patron type they figure. Said it, they said it would do a few points better if you were to come back. I think it probably could well do quite a lot of points better. I, I almost went, like, was that kind of the dig at Nigel Farage? Like it would do a few points better. Well, it may well have been a provocation. <laughs> Look, I haven't decided what I'm going to do. I, I've always been an issues campaigner. There are things that I care passionately about. There are things that I think, you know, the establishment gets wrong and need to be corrected. And I'm, I've been a very effective issues campaigner on, you know, financial issues, social issues, political issues. I think, I, I think, I believe I've been an effective campaigner on these things. And whether I campaign for them as a broadcaster or as a political campaigner, you know, elected politician, um, is almost by the by to me. I'm 50-50. Do I throw myself back into the front line of politics or do I keep going doing what I'm doing? You know, and I've got a television show that is really going from strength to strength, whose influence is enormous. I've got well over four million social media followers across the platforms, which in terms of this country is a very significant number, certainly in current affairs. Um, so we'll see. All will be revealed. You will be uh, September 25th with me. I think introducing me, Nomad Capitalist Live. We're so you will be, be there. Yep. You were there. Tell us about uh, your experience. And I like, I like how you call them delegates. Well, they were delegates, weren't they, that turned up in, in, in Mexico City. And, you know, these are people who, some of them are devotees of Nomad Capitalists. Others are complete new boys and girls who are coming along to listen to what you say. You've got a very broad array of speakers you know, across a, a very wide range of disciplines across the world. As I say, what I learned from my trip to Mexico City with you was that you are a very important insurance policy. And for anybody that's got a business or a creative idea or some wealth they might have built up, it makes a great deal of sense to come and listen to what you have to say. Uh, whether that actually translates into saying, right, I am going to move, to another part of the world. <clears throat> I need real, you know, legal advice, insurance advice, how I do it. And they come to you guys who've got the expertise to help them do that. But I, I, yeah, I think it's an insurance policy, but I think it's now one uh, that is becoming a much stronger option than it was just two short years ago. And I think that um, I'm sure you know, the Kuala Lumpur is going to be a huge success. And I'm looking forward to being there. What I loved about last year in Kuala Lumpur, the first time we did was an even more diverse group in terms of where they're coming from. People from Singapore, yeah. more Australians. Yeah. You're so, I mean, outside of North America, I think you're equidistant, if not closer to everyone else in the world. We've really got a great group. To me, that's what you want to see. You want to know where the opportunities are. Yeah, no, absolutely. Abs and, and a world that's changing rapidly. Parts of the world going up, parts of the world going down. Uh, no, it, it, I found the whole thing a great experience last time around. AirAsia CEO, Tony Fernandez. I have to say, I'm, I like this Michael O'Leary guy. Uh, Ryanair. He seems to be a hoot. But I'd rather, f I wouldn't fly in Ryanair. I would fly in AirAsia. And I hear some people saying that British Airways has gotten so bad. I can't speak to this myself, but it's gotten so bad. You'd rather fly in AirAsia. Here's a guy in Malaysia, bought it for less than a, a quid, and now it's billions. Yeah, and you admire it, I must admit. Um, I, my British Airways flights across the pond are becoming far less frequent. I'm choosing other, really? I'm choosing other airlines, yeah. yeah, yeah. I flew... Uh, I flew Virgin a couple of times in the last few weeks, been looked after beautifully. Uh, the Wi-Fi actually works. Uh, you know, yeah, British Airways has fallen badly behind. I can't say I was treated that bad. I went I think, through here to Dubai, but... Uh, it's not awful, but some of the competitors are better. That's all it is. Probably, you know. probably. Listen, I'll be there in Kuala Lumpur. I'll be speaking, I'll be meeting. And yes, I'm going to call them delegates because that's what I think they I are. I like that sophisticated. Well, why not? You know, um, I'm sure you're going to have a good number of people there. Uh, a big social media following and you know the timing of it's very interesting isn't it American elections coming just a few weeks later uh, which would be really really important um, and maybe we'll know a little bit more where we are with Gaza 
and Israel by that point. Brooklyn, you th is Trump your, is he going to win it? Oh, yes. For and, sure. Oh, no question. No question. No question. Sleepy Joe is out. It's going to be so great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think that, I think that Trump is, do you know, he's more electable now than he was in 2016. Really? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. People see past all the, the other stuff. I think. think that the attack on him by the judiciary just says to independently fair-minded people, this is wrong. Just plain blooming wrong. I think the border is an issue of national security. I think the huge increase in crime in American cities, all of which are run by Democrats, just look at San Francisco. Is that where you want America to be? I doubt it. I saw a, a bridge collapsed uh, just Quite the other day. And, and it just... Quite extraordinary, and we haven't got to the bottom of that. Had it been a suspension bridge that collapsed, I would have understood it. But this was a bridge with a series of pillars across the bay in Baltimore. Why one section being hit has collapsed the whole bridge. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I just, I, it, 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 totally extraordinary, totally extraordinary. And, and you, you say, well, how come the infrastructure in Dubai is so great and they don't, they don't tax personal income? But how does, what is the U.S., how does the U.K. have an excuse? I just don't. Anyway, Nomad Countless Live, you'll be there with us. Uh, I will. This September, nomadcomplice.com slash live. If you want to lower your taxes, you want to learn about the Plan B, uh, four great days. And, and we'll be sipping, uh, I don't know if it's Farage gin. But we'll have a gin and... and uh, I will make sure a couple of cases of Farage gin. A couple sense. of cases. I'll certainly do that, no problem at all. Yeah, look, I mean, like all these things in life, you know, it's important, it's educational, but you know what? It'll also be fun. We'll be sitting with the VIPs, you, me, and Hatia. We'll be, uh, we'll be sipping Farage gin <laughs> in Malaysia. Nigel Farage, good Thank to see you. Thank you very much. Here in London.